Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope everybody had a safe and peaceful weekend. Today, I want to talk through our COVID numbers. Uh, then we'll turn to some other matters, uh, and as you can see, we have some special guests with us today. Uh, first, our numbers continue to look favorable. Uh, our total case numbers have been trending downward. The number of hospital beds occupied by COVID patients is trending down, as is the number of patients hospitalized with a positive or pending COVID test. The percent of tests that are positive has dropped to 7.4% as of June the 12th. So all of these numbers uh, look positive, but I want to be clear about a couple of things. One, we will not be moving into phase three this week. On Thursday, we'll have more to say about what phase three would look like in the coming days, but I want to have more time to see how the numbers look before we make changes, uh, especially as we see surges uh, in other parts of our country. I also want to note an important change in how our Department of Health provides demographic data for COVID cases. Going forward, we'll be able to give a greater demographic breakdown of cases by different ethnicities. The Department of Health will be including information on cases among Latino, Asian American, and Native American Virginians, as well as Black Virginians. This will help give our health department a better picture of how the virus is affecting our communities. As we continue to fight this virus on the health front, we are also working on our economic recovery. This will be a multifaceted approach as we work to help businesses and communities across Virginia. We announced a new corporate headquarters with 700 new jobs just yesterday and another one today in Newport News with 332 new jobs. And today we announced a grant program to help visual artists in our Commonwealth. The Virginia Artist Relief Fellowship Program through the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts will give 40 Virginia visual artists a $5,000 grant each. We know that the economic impacts of this pandemic affect everyone. We'll talk more about the COVID pandemic on Thursday. In the meantime, I encourage all Virginians to maintain social distancing, wear face coverings, and wash your hands frequently because we know that these things work. I also want to address the unrest that continues in the city of Richmond. We have seen violence over the past few nights and Richmond has called in the state police for backup. I've seen some troubling videos of the interactions and we're going to take a look at these incidents. I am committed to addressing use of force protocols across the board. These have been a tumultuous few weeks in Virginia and in our nation. The protest and demonstrations set off by the killing of George Floyd and others unfortunately continue. It is important that we hear these voices and listen to what they're saying. They're saying it's time for an end to racial violence and systemic injustice. They're saying it's time to take a new look at how our systems and our institutions work or don't work for black people, Latino people, Asian people, Native American people, and people with disabilities. Our goal, my goal, is equity for all Virginians. It is important that we do that. I have personally listened to many stakeholders, both in the past few weeks and over the past year, and I hear you, and my administration hears you. Yesterday, I attended virtually a meeting of our African American History Commission. That commission is looking at how we can better teach our full history. The history that we teach now is insufficient and inadequate, especially when it comes to black and indigenous history. 
we must remember that black history is American history. And that is why today I'm announcing that it's time we commemorate another part of that history. You see, every year as a nation, we mark the 4th of July, Independence Day, celebrating our independence from English colonial rule. We celebrate this as a holiday, but that freedom we celebrate did not include everyone. And we have not elevated a different celebration of freedom Juneteenth, the day in 1865 that news of the Emancipation Proclamation had finally come to every state. In June of that year, the news arrived in Texas after the war ended and two years after the proclamation was signed. And finally, finally, enslaved black people there heard the news that they were free. Throughout American history, we've struggled to live up to our own ideals of freedom and justice for all. Since 1619, when representative democracy and enslaved African people arrived in Virginia within a month of each other, we have said one thing, but we've done another. Juneteenth is the oldest celebration of the end of slavery in the United States. Virginia has acknowledged this important milestone with an annual written proclamation. That's nice, but we need to do much more. It's time we elevate this, not just a celebration by and for some Virginians, but one acknowledged and celebrated by all of us, because that's how important this event is. It finally shut the door on the enslavement of African American people. And while it did not end racism, black oppression, or violence, it is an important symbol. By commemorating it, we push people to think about the significance of Juneteenth. Why does that day matter? It mattered then because it marked the end of slavery in the United States, but it matters now because it says to black communities, this is not just your history, this is everyone's shared history, and we recognize it together. So today, I'm announcing that I will propose legislation to make Juneteenth a paid state holiday. While we and 44 other states ceremonially commemorate Juneteenth, this action will formalize that observance. I believe Virginia will become only the second state to observe Juneteenth as a paid holiday for state employees. I hope our local governments will observe this holiday for their workers as well. The commemoration will start this Friday with a paid day off for executive branch state employees. <laughs> and I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the community leaders who are here with us today. They and others have been working for years to celebrate Juneteenth and to elevate it at the state level. This would not be happening without all of their hard work. We are changing what we honor in Virginia. Just this year, we finally passed legislation to stop celebrating Confederate generals with a state holiday. We replaced it with Election Day to emphasize the importance of voting and to make it easier for all Virginians. These con conversations must keep going. Some might say changing a state holiday is merely a symbolic action, but symbols do matter. If they didn't, people wouldn't be fighting so hard to keep Confederate flags and statues up. Symbols show what we value. This symbol, this holiday, is one step toward reconciliation. It is a step toward the Virginia we want to be as we go forward. It is a step toward the Virginia we want to leave for our children and grandchildren. It's one step forward in the work we have been doing to create real change. 
Last week, I announced that I'm extending and expanding our Commission on Racial Inequity in Virginia law. I'm asking that commission to review our current laws and regulations around education, public safety, criminal justice, health, housing, and voting. And we continue work to reduce disparities in educational attainment and school suspension rates, in maternal and neonatal mortality rates, in our courts and prisons, and in our business practices. We can create change through policy, but we also need to ensure that people understand why policies need to change and why the status quo is not equal for everyone. We do that through education and by changing hearts, and we can do that by shining a light on our history. So now, speaking of history, I'd like to ask Dr. Lornette Lee to come talk in more depth about the significance of Juneteenth. Dr. Lee, thank you. Well, Thank you, Governor Northam and First Lady. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Those words were written by James Weldon Johnson, beginning of the 20th century. And it speaks so eloquently to the experience that we have had here in America in lifting our voices. This is the time to lift all voices so that we can understand American history in its fullest. Why is this important to us here in Virginia? When it was those people in Galveston, Texas, 1866, who learned that they were free a year, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Why is it so important to us here in Virginia? Because on the eve of the Civil War, there were at least half a million people enslaved, torn from their families, sold away, many from Shaco Bottom. This is why we need to remember our history and, in fact, introduce our history to some people because it had not been taught in schools. And so to know that we have African-American teaching commission and possible in, in place to inspire others, inspire teachers and students to learn about this place, this time, will help us understand how we got to this moment, why it is so important for us to realize we have to do something when we see such unmitigated violence against unarmed people, against people who are trying to live what we call the American dream. This history matters. My grandmother used to say, teeth and tongue fall out, but in the end, they work best together. It took a while to understand that. But what I do understand in learning about our history is that we work best when we work together. This is the time for us to pull together, learn who we have been, who we are, and who we can be. This is our time. We've got to make this work. Peace be with you. So thank you, Dr. Lee, for your, your powerful words. I, now I'd like to ask the Reverend Kelvin Jones from First Baptist Church on the Eastern Shore to speak on the importance of faith as we continue our healing process. Reverend Jones, welcome. Thank you, Governor, for uh, extending the invitation to be here today. As we gather today, we must admit that Virginia and America has seen better days. We are a country and a commonwealth that is divided. We are a country and a state with a, with a horrific wound, and we have exceeded the use of a reasonable amount of Band-Aids to cover up that wound. In reality, what we should have been doing was applying the salve of mutual understanding and respect that provides healing. 
The challenge that is before us is how do we seek to find the good in each other? How do we reach a place where we can live as our brother's keeper and not in a world that is an environment of a wild, wild west environment or survivors of the fittest? How do those of us that are of different races and ethnicities work to find good in each other? How can we come together in such a manner that will allow police and citizens of the same community to coexist without having disdain one for the other? How do we create an environment and culture where children can turn on the television and watch a wholesome show rather than viewing constant hatred, bitterness, violence, and racism? How do we create a community where they see the best of adults instead of seeing us at our worst? One thing I've learned and lived long enough to learn is that an individual, if they're not careful, they will become the very thing that they hate, the very thing they see the most of. This hate will consume you and you will, will retaliate with hate. Thus, all we have is a world full of hate. Somehow, we must be, move beyond the racism, the hate, the lack of love, the insensitivity of the pain that others feel. We must somehow possess a degree of empathy for the fear that an entire culture feels whenever they walk outdoors. We must learn that to disagree does not have to mean death. We must recognize what this mindset of racism, this mindset that I'm above you and you are beneath me, the mindset that the extinction of one race at the empowerment of another will not make a Virginia nor America great. This mindset is detrimental. This cannot be what the Creator had in mind when he formed us and shaped us in his imago dei, in his image and in his likeness. So how do we get to the place where we can stop wearing t-shirts and putting on headstones, rest in peace, but learn how to live in peace? When do we become unified? America cannot heal. Virginia will not heal until we become unified. And I believe that we must understand that unity does not mean we agree in totality. But it, what it means is that we can sit down at the table of communication with differing opinions and come to the common ground that we need one another to survive. Then we get up and move into our communities with intentionality to eradicate racism. We can only survive when we unite. Otherwise, every one of us lives as endangered species trying to kill off the other. I submit to all of us today that some may not believe it, some may fight against it, but those with wisdom, those whose hearts are right, understand that none of us are an island and none of us can stand alone. Virginians, I say to you, we cannot continue the hatred. We cannot continue the racism. We cannot continue to destroy one another. We cannot continue to destroy our communities. As a person of faith and a leader of a congregation, a people of racial diversity, the question has been posed to me, where is God in all of this? And the response is that God is where he has always been, waiting to do what he always does, and that is heal people and heal circumstances. When we learn to lean on him, trust in him, and pray to him, the question now becomes, is more legislation what we need? I don't know. We have plenty of laws on the books that we haven't learned to enforce properly. Is more police training what we need? I don't know. We already attend academies for 20 to 33 weeks. But what I do know is something you cannot teach. You either have this or you don't. And that is respect, common courtesy for humanity, and treating people the way you want to be treated. And what we need is an encounter with the Almighty to change the hearts of individuals. He is the only one that can drive out hate, racism, and bitterness and give us hearts for the people that we are elected to serve and hearts for the people that we took an oath to protect and to serve. And when the hearts change, we can live in unity and live in peace. I believe it's time to make some new history, Virginia. Let us show the world what a colorblind state looks like. Let us show the world what a state that is inclusive looks like, regardless to race, creed, or color. Let us show the world how legislators serve all of its constituents, not just those who look like them. Let us show the world that we can be a state where our police take seriously the oath to protect and to serve 
all people of all color and that our people do not have to jog in fear, sleep in their bed in fear, nor pull up to a drive through and fall asleep in fear. We cause in Virginia, we believe in the preservation of life, not the infringement on life. And Virginia, as a commonwealth, I believe if a little church in the most impoverished county in the commonwealth has learned how to be unified and live peaceably and worship together at the most segregated hour in America, then we as a state can now model what the creator desires of all of us, and that is to live peaceably with one another. Thank you, Reverend Jones. So over this past weekend, I spoke with my friend Pharrell Williams, a native, as you know, of Virginia Beach. I told him what I was thinking, what our administration was thinking, and we shared thoughts on healing and unity in Virginia and in this country. He said, I want to join you. This is an important day for Virginia. You know, Pharrell has worked through his music to make Juneteenth more known and understood in our culture. I watched him bring people together last year with the Something in the Water Festival. Virginia needs that kind of spiritual unity now more than ever. So uh, please welcome uh, back to his home state and certainly back to our capital city, uh, our friend Pharrell Williams. Welcome, Pharrell. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Governor Northam. Thank you, Delegate Bagby, and all of you here today. This is a very special moment, very special. This is a big display of progress, uh, and I'm grateful for Virginia and us leading the way. From this moment on, when you look at, you look at the vastness of the night sky and you see those stars moving up there, know that those stars are our African ancestors dancing. They're dancing in celebration because their lives are finally being acknowledged. And I can't say it too many times up here today, a paid holiday. It's not the end of it. It's merely just the beginning. Um, their lives matter. Their descendants' lives matter. Black lives matter in the eyes of the commonwealth. I can't say that it always has. But finally, we recognize that black lives absolutely matter. And that's not political. They're lives, they're human beings. Virginia is where ships filled with kidnapped and enslaved Africans first landed on these shores over 400 years ago. 401 years to be exact. That's right, not far from here, my ancestors, my ancestors arrived on ships all of them were enslaved, and yes, I did my episode with Dr. Henry Lewis Skip, uh, Skip uh, Gates Jr. Sorry, sir. Um, I've done my Finding Your Roots episode, and yes, all of my ancestors were enslaved. My ancestors sacrificed their lives, they sacrificed their lives so that I could stand here today and use my voice. So yes, over the weekend I called the governor and I talked to him about um, what's happening today. This being a paid holiday, it's time. And what I said to him is yes, we can do better. And so this is what listening looks like. It makes sense that Virginia officially recognizes this, this holiday in this powerful way. And that's because it's been overlooked for so long. This is our chance in Virginia to lead by example. This is our chance to lead, to truly embrace the importance of Juneteenth and treat it as a celebration of freedom that black people deserve and African diaspora deserve. Worldwide, by the way. This is about proper recognition. It's about observation and it's about celebration. This is a chance for our government, our corporations, and our citizens to all stand in solidarity 
with their African American brothers and sisters. This year, Juneteenth will look like no other Juneteenth before it. People of all ages and races, our advocates and allies as well, included, will come together in solidarity for black people like never before. It's already happening in the streets, and we love you for that. And I'm grateful for those that are standing with us. By the way, those are Americans in the streets, not just people who look like me. Those are Americans, all types. This year, corporations are already stepping up for Juneteenth, but how far will they go? So me personally, I would like to see corporations who call Virginia their home lead the rest of the country, give people the paid day off so we can all stand in solidarity, right? This is our America. It's everybody's America, right? Right? Right. right. Okay. So our country excels, and I mean excels at celebrating Independence Day, but it's not perfect. Juneteenth deserves the same level of recognition and celebration. July 4th, 1776, not everybody was free in celebrating their Independence Day. So here's our day. And if you love us, it'll be your day too. Setting a new standard and leading how states observe Juneteenth is important because it, it, it implies there will be others to follow and there will be others to follow. Our women haven't had their day yet. There's so many people, so many demographics in our country that haven't had their day yet. Your days are coming. We are seeing an entirely new generation of leaders emerging right now, and they're potent. I'm personally, by the way, I'm personally working on a new project to propel some of the brightest minds and ideas emerging from some of our HBCUs historic black colleges and universities, to be clear. The strong leaders coming out of those schools are what the world needs right now, and especially right now. Today's announcement is much about the new generation as it is our African ancestors in the sky. This new generation is speaking up and staring down. They are staring down systemic racism with so much bravery, and it's super inspiring. There is no turning back with love, with humility and respect, but there's no turning back. We are only moving in one direction now, forward, the future. Once again, I'm super grateful for Virginia and us leading the way. Thank you again. Have a blessed day, and God is the greatest. Thank you so much for your, for your presence and, and your, your words. Finally, uh, as you see, we have a lot of guests here today, but I'd like to especially recognize our elected officials. Uh, we have our Attorney General, Mark Herring. Mark, uh, just thank you for joining us today. Uh, our Speaker of the House, uh, and I will remind you, the first woman uh, Speaker of the House in 400 years, uh, Eileen Fillicorn. Eileen. Welcome, and thank you for being here today. Uh, we have our Senate Majority Leader, Dick Sasslaw. Thank you for your leadership. We also have the Senate Caucus Leader, Senator Mamie Locke, who you'll be hearing from in just a second. Uh, we have our House Majority Leader, Charnel Herring, uh, and then also we have Delegate Lamont Bagby, Chair of the Virginia Black Legislative Caucus. So uh, please give our elected officials around. Hold on now. <laughs> and we also have from 757, Senator Louise Lucas. Louise, welcome. I, thank you. And I should probably look around, but I appreciate you giving all of them a hand for their great leadership. And Josh is Josh. Josh, thank you for being with us. Another round of applause for Josh. So if I could, I'd, I'd like to have Senator Locke uh, offer some words and then uh, Charnel Herring, Delegate Herring, and then uh, we'll be glad to take questions after that. So Delegate, uh, excuse me, Senator Mamie Locke, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. June and 19th, 
in true African-American fashion, that was May Juneteenth. And it was already stated that um, Juneteenth became recognized by um, enslaved people in Texas because Texas was the most remote of the slave states. Um, and of course, the Union Army got there last uh, to let enslaved people know that slavery had ended many years after the Emancipation Proclamation and um, in Galveston, Texas to let them know slavery was over and on June 19th. So June and 19th becomes Juneteenth. So we commemorate the emancipation of enslaved people in the United States on Juneteenth. So thank you, Governor, for recognizing the sacredness and importance of Juneteenth. It is so important to African-American people to know that this sacred holiday has become important to those of us here in Virginia. Yesterday, I was at Fort Monroe at a meeting and governor was almost there to tell people, you just don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, um, about Juneteenth, because we were talking about things that we could do um, commemorating in August, the first landing. Um, and the executive director said, you know, we should do something about Juneteenth. I said, oh, you just wait. <laughs> um, you know, we are. Uh, and one of the things that happened in Texas was that Texas being the most remote of the slave states, uh, of course, enforcement was, the two words that stood out to me was slow and inconsistent. And it reminded me of things that tend to happen as it relates to us as African Americans when it has come to freedom and liberation, slow and inconsistent. Much has been slow and inconsistent. If anything has come out of what has happened over the course of the last three weeks is that we are done with slow and inconsistent. That the time has come for us to begin to move forward with laws and policy changes that makes freedom and liberation a reality in this country. And having Juneteenth recognized for the sacredness that it is to us as African Americans is one huge step forward. So thank you, Governor, for recognizing that. So we appreciate the support that we have been given in this Commonwealth for us, not only as African American people, but for our history. And given the history of Fort Monroe, where slavery began to rear its ugly head in 1619, but we also need to recognize that in 1861, it began to unravel at that same place. And at the Emancipation Oak on, on the campus of Hampton University, mm -hmm. slaves heard the Emancipation Proclamation read. And that slavery was unraveling in this state. And that we too took down the Jefferson Davis Arch at Fort Monroe last year. Mm -hmm. That we understand here in Virginia that history has its place, but we don't believe in revisionist history. That we believe in history as the story to be told and that African Americans have a role in that history and that African American history is, as the governor said, America's history. And we need to tell that history with truth. So thank you also very much for being here as we begin to, to commemorate Juneteenth for the treasure that it is. Thank you so very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharnell Hearing. I'm the House Majority Leader, and it's especially uh, it's a special honor to be here with you today um, because I'm the first African American Majority Leader in the Commonwealth's history. And so this day has special meaning for me. I want to thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you, Governor, because considering what we have seen in the past weeks in Virginia, it is more than appropriate that we declare Juneteenth a state holiday. Viewing the history of African Americans through the lens of slavery and Jim Crow, we see that leg legacies still exist in our institutions, including criminal justice system, police contact to incarceration, and in our courts. There can be no doubt that our nation, indeed Virginia, is at a crossroads. This is in our hands. The question is, will we be bold and upright the wrongs of slavery and institutionalized racism and be persistent in our quest from now on? Or do we just let, let this opportune moment pass? I encourage every Virginian, no matter your race, to treat Juneteenth as a time for reflection, conversation, and most importantly, action. It is time that we reassess the core components of our society and ensure that it is fair, equitable, and just for everyone. Now this task is not easy, as it will force each and every one of us to reflect on our Commonwealth's policies and see our future with new lens. Thank you so much. So I'll be glad to take a couple questions. Andre. Governor, there are some folks who see some of these uh, incredible historic maneuvers that you are making as um, inappropriate. They say that uh, you are doing too much for black folks and making too much of race. And then I've had a question for Pharrell, if you don't mind. Yes, did. so you would like me to comment, are we doing too much? I, I, we still have so much to do, Andre, and uh, this is just uh, another step in, in the right direction of, of I think, really uh, telling the history, uh, the wrong history uh, of Virginia, uh, 400 years, and, and really, and I think uh, Delegate Herring, I, I appreciate your words, she, as she said, we're, we're at an intersection, Andre, uh, she called it a crossroads. Um, our society and, and being leaders uh, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we can either uh, go one way and continue the divisiveness or we can go the other way and start healing and unifying and bringing people together because there's a lot of the powerful words you've heard up here uh, this afternoon. That's the only way that we can survive uh, as a society uh, and as a Commonwealth and as a country. And so, uh, so uh, this is just uh, a step. Um, I continue to listen. I continue to learn. As you've heard me say, the more I know, uh, the more we know, the more we can do. And, and so that's really our, our goal as we, we move forward. And, I, and I, uh, you have a question for Mr. Williams. Yes, uh, Pharrell, for the young people who say that they, they didn't get guidance from the older generations, our generations and those before, and now they are figuring this thing out on the fly. They're doing it their way and by any means necessary. What would you say to the young people who feel as though they've, they've got to figure this out on their own? I don't know that they have to figure it out on their own, but I'm incredibly proud that they are um, grabbing the bull by the horn the best way that they can. Every generation has a different point of view, and I think we all have to respect that. Um, the millennials and the Gen Zers, uh, they're going to be the ones that are going to figure this out um, ultimately. But in the interim, it's our responsibility while we um, have the opportunity and while I have a voice, I know that it's my, it is not only my moral and spiritual obligation, but it's also my genetic obligation to make sure that I'm aiding them and aiding my culture as much as I can. Um, now I'm, I'm excited. Um, to do that. This is a long time coming. Um, and as I said before, this is not ending something. This is the beginning of something much bigger and much greater. Yes, sir. Thank you for real. Uh, 
Hi, Governor. Um, a new study published today shows that children and teens are half as likely to get COVID-19. Does this influence your plans for reopening schools and daycares? I'm not sure I heard the first part of your question. I, I think what, what you're saying is that children and teens are uh, still likely to uh, to contract uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, we... There's a new study published today. Yes, we, you know, okay, just... The COVID study. Yes, uh, the, the question about uh, children and, and teens, and uh, not to get into a, a thorough detail of, of COVID-19 again, but we are seeing uh, what is happening across this country with surges. Um, I am pleased that Virginia is where we are today, but uh, as we move forward, we need to do it responsibly, as I've said all along. Uh, we need to, to use science. We need to follow our data. Um, and, you know, as, a, as a, a physician who has taken care of children for over 30 years, we are seeing uh, cases uh, of children that are affected by the COVID-19 and, and affected quite adversely. And so, uh, as a physician, as the governor, um, I've said this before, we have a health crisis. We also have an economic crisis, but in order to move on to our economy, we've got to get this health crisis uh, under control and, and behind us. And so that's what I'm committed to doing. Um, Cam, you had a question. I was going to say, you mentioned the troubling videos and that you'd be uh, investigating. Yes. Can you elaborate on what videos you're referring to and what exactly your administration will be investigating and potentially doing as a result? Well, what I was referring to, obviously there are a lot of troubling videos uh, from across the country and across the world for that matter, but uh, concentrating on, on Virginia and specifically here uh, in Richmond. Uh, as I said last night, the state police uh, was asked to come in and support the Richmond Police Department. Uh, they agreed to do that. Uh, I have watched some of the videos. I want to continue to, to review them. I want to reach out and, 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 and discuss this further uh, with the police departments, um, and, and we will move forward together. So that's what I was referring to. And if I could follow up sure. COVID-19, um, what has been compliance been so far with your mask mandate? Has VDH gotten any complaints? Have they issued any of these class one misdemeanors to anyone who we might have been reported? No, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't uh, issued any any class one uh, misdemeanors. But but I would say, Cam, uh, just uh, I was in Newport News uh, this morning for uh, a jobs announcement. I'm starting to get out, travel more. Uh, as you know, I've been to the to the ocean front. Um, I, I'm pleased uh, with what I see uh, so far. Obviously, not everybody is complying, but I think the great majority of Virginians understand. Uh, what we're up against. They understand the importance of the social distancing, the wearing of the facial protection, and, and the, the cleaning of our hands. And, and if we're going to move forward, if we're going to go into phase three and, and beyond, uh, we've got to uh, accept that this is going to be the new normal uh, until we either have a vaccination or a treatment, neither of which we have today. So uh, overall, I'm pleased with the way Virginians. And, and again, if you look at the other states, Cam, and uh, obviously I'm proud to be a Virginia. I think we, we live in the best state in the best country. Um, we're in a good place right now, but we need to maintain that uh, status. And in order to do that, we've got to continue to follow the guidelines. Um, the next question will be from David McGee with the Bristol Herald Courier. Yes, thank you, Governor. Uh, in light of all the, the demonstrations and marches and large gatherings of, of significant numbers of, of people, many of them who apparently are not wearing masks, how concerned is your administration that this may cause a spike in COVID-19 cases in the next few weeks? Yeah, the question is about uh, protesters uh, not maintaining social distancing, a lot of them not wearing masks. It's, it is concerning to me. Um, and a couple of things, uh, I have encouraged uh, uh, folks that uh, choose to protest, which is their uh, right here in this Commonwealth and in, in this country to, to please uh, uh, think about themselves, think about their families, think about others who are around them uh, and follow our, our guidelines. And I have also uh, encouraged them, uh, and I will uh, do it again, uh, we have a number of testing sites across Virginia. Uh, and if you have been out uh, in the public and perhaps could have been exposed to uh, COVID-19, please uh, stop by one of our community testing sites and, and be tested. Uh, so uh, I will continue to encourage that. Thank you all again uh, for being with us today. Um, this is a, a, a meaningful day, a historic day for, for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, and on behalf of Virginia, I just I hope you can see all of the folks that are 
with us today uh, that, that really uh, want to take that turn at that intersection and, and bring people together to stop the divisiveness and, and make a Commonwealth of Virginia that is truly inclusive, uh, that is truly welcoming, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, the color of your skin, who you love, we welcome you here to the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we're going to continue uh, to move forward together. So thank you all, and I will look forward to being with you on Thursday. We'll talk more about what phase three looks like at that time, but uh, in the meantime, uh, be safe and stay healthy. Thank you all.